thanks everyone. I guess I should point out a couple directions. I actually started exploring uh, places like this in 2005, and I started to do it weekly in 2007, actually. Uh, also, that database of 266 is now closer to about 280. It's, just, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, anyway, I'm going to try to be hurrying through this lecture. It's mostly visual, so I think we need to have the lights dimmed up here. I don't know how to do that. Uh, I'm going to be whipping through about a hundred slides, but we're going to be skipping by many of them very, very quickly anyway. Uh, so uh, to begin with, I wanted to talk a bit about something, uh, let's just get it out of the way, uh, the methodology of what I uh, do and how I do it. Uh, and then we're going to get into the actual content, because I'm getting really tired of being interviewed and talking about urban exploration. As Brother Anthony said, it's about visiting places that are not normally uh, accessible by the public through ordinary means. Uh, that might uh, include places that have been abandoned for whatever reason. By the way, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm not uh, screwing up with the microphone or anything, good. Uh, we also uh, spend a lot of time on rooftops, which is a surprisingly easy thing to do in Korea. Uh, and there is quite a large rooftoping uh, photography community in Korea. We do other weirder things too, sometimes visit construction sites, uh, rivers underground, all sorts of other tunnels. and even weirder random stuff. Uh, the important thing about uh, this hobby though is the community of people who do this always stand by uh, a rigid code of ethics. And uh, I, I know one of the people in this room actually is always looking down his nose at me for uh, not being as ethical as him sometimes. Uh, not to name names. Uh, we also, uh, in Korea, I, I face a lot of difficulties doing this because of trying to uh, get along with local sensibilities. A lot of uh, Korean people generally are bothered by my attention to a place, places like this. One time several years ago, I was in a, an old kind of warehouse district, just a little bit south of Dongdaemun Market, and uh, I could hear smashing sounds outside. I didn't know what it was. I went upstairs about three or four flights, and I ran into this elderly uh, scavenger who was throwing scrap metal out the window, and when he saw me, he asked what I was doing, and I said, oh yeah, just taking pictures. And he immediately said, oh, I go, I'm so embarrassed for my country. So he was embarrassed that I was there uh, uh, taking pictures of just this, this uh, area that he was scavenging. I found that very eerily ironic. Uh, and uh, over the years that I've been doing this, I, I've, uh, I've felt like looking back at my pictures, I've recorded uh, a lot of neglected parts of contemporary history, uh, certain places and uh, views even that uh, no longer exist, uh, might be uh, only in some of the pictures that I've taken near the end of their lives. So in, uh, over the last, I uh, guess, 15 years now, I've uh, compiled a database online. I'm not the only uh, contributor for Korea, but I've done most of it. Uh, this is a list of all the different types of sites I've gone to, so you can get an idea of how much I've seen and how I can uh, you know, put some uh, formalization into it. Uh, abandoned neighborhoods, which are uh, just large tracts of uh, land with the buildings anywhere between one and three stories tall. Uh, th they uh, clear those all out at uh, once, and um, these areas can be quite, quite large. Uh, I've been to about 65 of those areas in Seoul. Uh, 11 uh, outside Seoul in Gyeonggi-do, and only two more outside, further away, just because I don't travel that much. This is really probably best as an indicator of where I've traveled rather than uh, a lot of the other realities of uh, urban renewal across Korea. Uh, so that's the uh, interesting number here, is the 65 uh, neighborhoods. In total, there have been all sorts of other things. I'm not going to go into them all, because most of them aren't quite relevant to uh, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. In, in total, uh, this number here, 246, is roughly how many uh, locations I've made, and there are many, many more that other people have done, adding up to 270, whatever. So I wanted to start by mentioning a few key points that you're going to see repeated uh, visually throughout a lot of these pictures. Uh, probably a lot of this is very familiar to most of you. I think most of you here know that Seoul is over 600 years old, and uh, it's gone through a lot of different uh, stages, but uh, uh, definitely following the Korean War, uh, the slate was wiped clean and the city was rebuilt from scratch. And uh, probably in that time, that level of, uh, let's say, change and, I don't want to say damage, has been inflicted on the city many times. Also, very important, Seoul is a very vertical city. 
Uh, if you ride around on a bike, you know what I'm talking about. You can't go anywhere uh, without, you know, getting a bit out of breath. If you uh, look up, there's always mountains around you, there's always buildings, uh, there's, there's so many different layers of it. And that, uh, the politics of a lot of urban renewal issues come into play based on that slope. Uh, Seoul is always outwardly and upwardly expanding. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about how it's expanded over the last 50 years. Whoops. Uh, it's still changing very quickly, although it's slowed down a little bit because of the current mayor. And it's a uh, juxtaposition of developed and undeveloped, industrial and post-industrial, first world and third world. And uh, we talk about you know, how it's, uh, you know, you can see ancient buildings next to new buildings, but there's really a lot more to it than that. Um, and there's also a lot of conflict in urban development because not everybody is uh, given the same opportunities to uh, advance with everybody else. So anyway, I'm going to skip through a lot of this. This is a map of Seoul, and everybody knows this. This is a pretty standard looking map to most of us now, but if you were to go back in time, uh, even a little less than 100 years ago, it would have looked like this. And we are right now, I can point it out on my cursor, we're probably about right here, I'd say. Um, and uh, the boundaries of Seoul were very different at the time. The mountains up here uh, look pretty much the same and are very familiar. This down here at the southern boundary is Namsan. And one of the things that really shocked me a few years ago, there was uh, a guy who had, um, I forget his name right now, but he posted some pictures on YouTube, sorry, Flickr, of his childhood. He grew up in Korea in the 50s and 60s. And uh, so he had pictures of his home in Itaewon, a village south of Seoul, so somewhere down here. Uh, yeah, that's definitely now, we would probably consider that northern Seoul, a lot of people. So anyway, uh, the expansion of Seoul happened over a very long period of time. During the Japanese occupation, uh, Seoul expanded down south to Yongsan. So probably even when that guy lived there, uh, Itaewon would have been part of Seoul already. Yongsan, Mapogu, Songdonggu, Sodemungu, Dongdaemun, and Yongdungpo were incorporated into Seoul City during the Japanese occupation. So roughly a central area here like that. Uh, and then only in 1975 was Gangnam added, and then after that, uh, Gangso, which I can never, yeah, it's over here, yeah. Um, and the city slowly expanded outward. In 1988, as recently as that, Yangcheon, Songpa, Socho, Jungnang, and Noanku were all added. And then 1996, which is pretty recent in my memory at least, uh, they finally added Gwangjinggu, Gangbukgu, and Kumcheonggu. So uh, I don't think there's any room to grow anymore because all of these areas here either border with mountains or with other cities. And it's either going to be uh, eat out those other cities, which is unlikely, or keep going. Um, now we can actually uh, see a lot of history in just downtown. Uh, not too long ago, I wanted to add some of uh, this content. Uh, in uh, Incidon, in they dug out a few buildings and, uh, of course, I went in and saw them when they were going down. But more interestingly, after they were gone, uh, the archaeological surveys came in. Uh, as far as I know, in Jongnogu and I believe Junggu, uh, every archaeological urban renewal project has to have an archaeological survey to see what was there before. And uh, this particular area is in Sogongdong, kind of across the street from, is that the Western Joseon, I think? And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, they, until very recently, this was a parking lot. And they just recently uncovered it and are doing this interesting excavation there. What happens after that? Almost certainly this won't be preserved. Uh, best case scenario, something that, that I've been seeing happen a lot around downtown is they do this weird thing where they uh, probably totally remove a, a, a historic site like this and maybe move it away for, uh, I don't know, more analysis. Then they put it back and they put it under glass. I noticed about five locations like this around downtown Seoul uh, that have opened up in buildings in the last maybe two or three years. And I have a feeling we're gonna to start to see a lot more. And if, if this is actually meaningful, I actually don't really know. I, I kind of have my doubts. So anyway, after that era, we had, uh, well, after the Joseon Dynasty, we had the uh, Jap Japanese occupation of Seoul. And they really modernized the city and uh, created a lot of buildings. Most of which aren't still here, but there are still a few interesting exceptions. Uh, this is a picture from an area just a little bit west of Sodimun. Um, 
And you can see, uh, what was in this area? It's, uh, no, no, can't you? Uh, I can't quite remember right now. Donimun Newtown, that's it. And uh, when they were renewing this area, they demolished a large amount of really nice old Han Oaks. And in this one little cluster here, I was really surprised to notice this little building on top of the hill here. And this probably, these probably all maybe roughly date back to the Japanese occupation. And you can note that uh, this little building here was built uphill of all these homes. The, the word in Korean for a lot of these buildings, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is called Joksan Gao, which essentially means enemy home. And there are still many of these left, and I, I'm, I'm sad to see I don't see any of my friends who are experts on them right here right now. But Robert Kohler is the guy to talk to about that. Uh, he leads a lot of tours for the RES to these things. And um, they actually have been having a lot of trouble preserving places like this because people don't really want them preserved in a lot of cases. Uh, there are a few exceptions. Uh, Seoul City Hall, of course, was built by the Japanese. And uh, a few years ago in 2008, they almost destroyed it. But uh, preservation committees managed to stop the progress right after uh, the shells had struck, causing quite a bit of damage here. Also, uh, Seoul Station was built during the Japanese occupation. They recently did a, did a very interesting job of restoring it as Culture Station 284. Um, it's a pretty nice place, but I don't really remember the old one. And there's, uh, this is from 1996, the Governor General building. Uh, this uh, big monstrosity was uh, right in front of uh, Gyeongbok Palace. And you can see, uh, this is actually basically Guangha Moon right here. And I'm standing inside the palace while I'm taking this. And I can't see down to where the statues are because of the Governor General building in the way. So uh, they decided to remove this one just because of its very unfortunate position. Oh, uh, you don't want to see a picture of me with long hair. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so during the Korean War, the pre-war population was 1.446 million. And uh, right after the Korean War broke out on June 28, 1950, uh, Seoul uh, basically was overtaken by North Korean forces. One million of the population remained and 400,000 evacuated. And then, uh, not too later that year, uh, Seoul was retaken by our side. And uh, presumably a lot, of the, a lot of those people moved back. Then a few months later, enemy forces retook Seoul, and once again, 800,000 were evacuated and only 133,000 remained. And then in 1951, March 14, it was retaken by our side again. So the amount of uh, fighting that went through there really leveled the uh, city uh, quite a lot and didn't leave a lot behind. The city didn't quite suffer total devastation, but near total. Enough that uh, there was really a chance to start kind of a, like a new city plan for it, which didn't quite happen because of the chaos in the ensuing years. Uh, refugees returned to Seoul by uh, the hundreds of thousands, and a lot of the people who lived there before found their homes destroyed, and uh, a lot of other people just moved there over the next uh, several years anyway. So shanty towns started appearing all over the city, and we're going to talk about three in particular, three types in particular. The Moon Village, or Dal Dongne. Uh, my understanding is the term refers to uh, how um, uh, it's close to the moon, basically. Uh, and we'll also talk about Cheonggyecheon and the unusual developments that have happened there, as well as uh, Seun Sangha, uh, which is supposed to come, become a green belt sometime in the distant future. So, Moon Villages. Everybody always says, when, when one of these is demolished, oh, this is the last Dal Dongne of Seoul, but there's always more. Uh, this one here is uh, still sitting in somewhere in Dongjakgu, and uh, it has a low occupancy rate, but is still very much there. Um, if you've been to Brazil, you might think it looks like a, a Brazilian favela, but certainly the culture that exists around here uh, is very, very different. And currently, um, anybody who would live in an area like this is probably elderly, or at the very, very least, maybe an artist who's trying to have a weird experience. Uh, a lot of these, <laughs> it happens. <I've laughs> a lot of these places um, can date back to the 50s, uh, but many of them are actually much younger. Uh, but basically, the reason that these exist on hillsides is because when everybody was moving back into the city, you know, the people who got there the fir first and uh, got the best land tended to be the richer people. So the poorer people just built higher and higher up on the hillsides until they could have, uh, you know, until they could find a natural spot. Some of these places were very precarious. Many of them were really, really uh, 
prone to uh, all sorts of hazards like uh, landslides and uh, floods and things like that. Well, not floods, yeah, I guess that would still be landslides. People living along the riverside would have uh, certainly had their problems with floods. Uh, and since about the 1980s, mostly because of the, the you know, increase of cars and all sorts of construction technology, this land is a lot more popular to developers, so that's immediately where uh, people, you know, developers want to build now. Uh, I mentioned before that this uh, country is, uh, or this city is really still a, a juxtaposition of uh, first world and third world. Uh, here's an ex interesting example. I believe this building is gone now, but over in Sangdo Dong, uh, here's a, chi uh, a house where they're raising their own chickens in, uh, in front of some nice modern high rises. Uh, and this, this is the kind of thing that you're not seeing as much of anymore, but it still exists. And it's still quite a, a shocking view of you know, the, uh, the gap in uh, income of people like this. So one of the things that happened to a lot of these areas is they've become kind of art villages or mural villages. Uh, a lot of people are familiar these days with Ihua Mural Village, where they have paintings on the walls. Uh, these two pictures are from Kimi Maru, uh, which is over in uh, kind of near uh, Hongjie Dong. And uh, basically artists came in trying to support the people living there and uh, drew art on the walls so that it would be recognized as having some sort of deeper intrinsic value. Um, did it? I'm not too sure. The, the residents are still living there and they're still stuck in the same conditions as before. No real improvements have been made to their homes. Uh, and we really can't save all these communities this way anyway, so uh, I guess these things are going to exist as a novelty here and there across, uh, across the country. Uh, let's get on to Chungyechan, a very popular uh, place these days. It, of course, used to be the river that went right through the middle of Seoul, and uh, then they decided to bury it. This is a picture of the, the shanty town that existed along the, uh, the shore, or river, the bank of uh, Chungyechan. Uh, back uh, before it was buried in the 60s. Uh, here's a picture of it being buried in the 60s. Of course, these pictures aren't mine. I, uh, I think it will be pretty obvious which I took and which I didn't. Generally, if it's black and white, it's not mine. So I don't want to take credit for this. And <laughs> I don't want you thinking I've been around that long. So um, they covered the thing up. And I wish I had visited there just uh, a, a couple years earlier because uh, it sounds like when they uncovered it, they revealed some really amazing things. Uh, but during uh, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, up to 2003 or 4, it was an overpass. And uh, I guess probably a lot of people who, who are here now can't remember back when this overpass ran through what we now consider Changyechan. I barely remember myself, actually. Uh, when they demolished it, everybody was concerned about uh, traffic, but some very unusual things happened about that. Um, I, I actually have a slide about that later. Uh, this is modern day Changyechan. I actually ran out and uh, wanted to go to this area to take this picture because it's my favorite part of Changyechan, where they actually recreated the uh, shanty town as part of the Changyechan Museum. Uh, it's a pretty nice park now, and there are a lot of big advantages to it. Um, it was originally proposed in 2003, and uh, at the time, everybody considered it a vanity project of Mayor Lee You know, everybody thought, oh, he's going to run for president, and he's going to use this for that. He was named Hero of the Environment in uh, Time Magazine 2007, uh, which might have been a bit hasty, but oh well. Uh, <laughs> the redevelopment cost was 281 million US dollars, and I don't, I don't remember the cost now, but it's been recently appraised that they're going to have to pay a lot more money to uh, fix the ecosystem of this place. Uh, management costs are always going up. Uh, the water that you see in it is basically pumped in from the Han River, and also subway runoff. Uh, the actual original sources of uh, Changyechan originate in the three mountain peaks on the northern side of Seoul. And the, because of the, basically the way that those hills are forested now, there's just no water coming down to, to fuel, the, fuel Changyechan. Um, but I think Changyechan has been a, a success despite that, and despite the fact that uh, it costs a lot and uh, the water's not that clean. Uh, people love it. Like if you go there, people are walking around. Uh, it actually succeeded in reducing the urban temperature of the downtown core by 3.6 degrees Celsius, which is uh, very impressive on, uh, when you're sweating like I am. Um, and uh, the, the more unusual thing was uh, an interesting term called Brace's Paradox. Basically, Brace's Paradox is that the more roads you build, 
the uh, fewer, uh, sorry, the more the more cars will hit those roads, and the more traffic there will be. If you remove roads, then um, you remove traffic somehow. So uh, when the overpass was removed, uh, traffic actually sped up and was faster and more efficient because fewer cars were on the road. Maybe people said, well, my route to work is gone. I'm going to take the subway. Uh, that's the best guess that I have. But it definitely held up, and it reduced traffic in downtown. Whoops. Oh, yeah, that's the right side. Uh, the sad story about, uh, about Chongyuchan was the market that they removed in order to uh, restore the stream. Im Young Bak uh, gave uh, the, P the marketeers of that area a promise. He said, you can move to Dongdaemun Stadium and set up your flea market there, and you'll be there as long as you want. We'll fix it up, we'll make it world class, it'll be really nice. Uh, it didn't go that way, of course. If you, uh, if you haven't seen Dongdaemun Stadium around, that's because it's now uh, Dongdaemun Design Plaza. Um, in 2008, uh, demolition began on this building. The uh, baseball stadium next door had already been mostly knocked down. Um, and three days after I took this picture at Dongdaemun uh, Stadium, they sent in the hired goons to uh, evict the people. It was 500 hired goons versus 75 mostly elderly people, like the people that you could imagine being here. And uh, after that, they uh, built Dongdaemun Design Plaza. So these people got kicked out of Changyecheon, and then they got kicked out again of their second place. But uh, anyway, I don't want to give uh, Dongdaemun Design Plaza any more time than I feel like right now. Um, more importantly to me right now is that there are many, many more of these underground rivers to be uncovered. Uh, so uh, there's, there are a lot of potential future growth for uh, parks all over, all over Seoul. And uh, this one looks, by the size of it, I think it might be actually bigger than, uh, uh, than uh, Changyecheon. If you want to know where it is, join me on Sunday with uh, my Yongsan tour. We're not actually going to go there, though. Uh, there are also many uh, overpasses that will be demolished over the next while. This is Ahyan Overpass, the first built in uh, Seoul. I, I don't know about Korea, probably Korea. It was built in 1968, and they just knocked it down last year. Uh, they're knocking down, they've knocked down a few others. Uh, and most interestingly, Seoul Overpass. I'm sure most of you heard about this project because it kind of made the news not too long ago. Uh, this uh, overpass has been declared unfit for uh, you know road traffic. So rather than knock it down, they're working on the plan to turn it into a park. Um, and actually, I've been uh, using this to drive to and from work for the last while. Over here, uh, over where Namdaemun kind of touches with the other edge of it, there are protest signs from uh, marketers there who don't want it knocked down because they're afraid it will increase traffic, uh, which is not what happened at Changyecheon, of course. So. I don't know, I, I think that um, a market that relies on foot traffic is going to really benefit from having foot traffic coming there from Seoul Station. We'll see. Oh yeah, so this is Seoul Station, this is old Seoul Station here. So I wanted to mention quickly, I, I always found this interesting, uh, Im Young Bak, when he was the mayor of Seoul, he built a canal across the city. When he was president of Korea, he wanted to build a canal across Korea. Uh, and you can see on this his original plan to connect Seoul and Busan by water, rather than go out here and go the long way around. I guess it might save some trouble. It was uh, controversial enough that it didn't happen. Not controversial enough that he got that much criticism for it, but it ultimately became the uh, Four Rivers Restoration Project. And you can see there are little there are gaps here, like they wanted to connect this even underground partway to create the, the, uh, the canal. Um, has this been a success? It really sounds not that pleasant right now, but uh, I'm not uh, going to talk too much about it because uh, it's outside of Seoul. So let's move on to apartments and the rise of apartments that happened in the 60s. Apartments were first built as public housing or siminapata to uh, give those people in those horrible little shanty towns a nicer place to live. Uh, what actually happened was uh, re the residents of Seoul who had more money were able to uh, move in there first. So these apartments were uh, mostly home to the uh, middle class, many of the ones that I'll show to you soon. Uh, originally, a lot of citizens were terrified of tall buildings, and it actually took uh, a propaganda com campaign linking the, uh, the, the link between the high rises and affluence in order to get people to want to move into uh, something like this, let alone something like this. So apartments in, uh, began appearing in the 60s. I, I wouldn't say the affluent, judging by my wording here, but they, they housed the, uh, 
middle class, and some of them house the uh, upper middle class. Malibu Apartments was the very first, as far as I know, at least the first high-rise complex. It was built in 1962, and it had Western-style space heaters, uh, not the Ondal system, which really caused a lot of problems for Korean residents who didn't really know what a space heater was, and who were used to the advantages of an Ondor. So the idea of, of not having an Ondor in an apartment today sounds pretty ridiculous. And it was not popular without them in Mapo apartments. These are gone. Uh, Seon Arcade, I really should use one of my pictures, uh, was an interesting place. It's um, basically four buildings linked together across the downtown core. And um, they have uh, apartments up here, and then lower down they have markets and commerce. Um, most recently, when it was active, up until the, uh, like, I think, 89, this was actually the main electronics market of, of Seoul until it moved to Yongsan. Um, this, it was actually built uh, on land that was originally cleared by the Japanese to uh, make kind of a, 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 what do you call it, like a, a, a big trench where if there was a fire during Allied bombing of Korea, which never happened, um, then the fire couldn't spread from one side to the other. So the land had already been cleared, and it was home to a, uh, a, a, a shanty town, basically. Uh, so they were pretty easily able to evict those people and build this, uh, the electronics market, which is still there and isn't an electronics market anymore. Uh, one of the buildings is now a modern hotel. It's been very nicely refurbished. Uh, one of the buildings hosts a flower market um, and is very fragrant. I really like it. Um, and yes, the, the pornography stores also seem to be gone too, although you can still find some traces of them. Um, it was originally considered a failure when it was completed because uh, in the eyes of the architect, um, it kind of was strangulating through traffic. So uh, that's one reason why the area around it is a little undeveloped and everything to the, uh, what's that, the east of it, towards Dongdaemun, is uh, a little le less nice than the, uh, the side that you know, towards downtown. Uh, and there was a plan to restore it as a green belt, essentially turning it back into what Japan made there, a giant, mostly empty parkland. Uh, that has fallen through, but it still could happen in the, maybe in a future mayoral administration. Uh, um, looks like that's cut off, oops. It was built in 1970 on the no yeah, northern slope of Namsan. It's still there and it's a beautiful building, but they have signs there telling warning you not to go there for uh, just to take pictures. They're really tired of visitors. It's now rated D-class, though. Um, so there's been talk about redevelopment as far back as maybe 2003, maybe earlier. Oh, and there was a K-pop song written about it in 1982. If anybody remembers, Yoon Suri Apatu apparently is about this place. <laughs> Ogin Apartments, uh, these were uh, built in 1971 on, uh, 71 on the slope of Inmangsan. And they were intended to be within viewing distance from Changwade, so that uh, visiting dignitaries could see all oh, these these nice apartments that are going up. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they were um, uh, de demolished by 2010, maybe a bit later for some of them. But uh, for a few years, uh, there was a very interesting community that formed out of it called the Ogin Collective. I don't know if anybody is here from that right now, but um, they basically would have events where you could go and visit these buildings as they were mostly abandoned and walk on tours in it. They actually found some bowling balls in one building and they had uh, they set up a rooftop bowling alley, which was a really weird noise when you're walking around. There was still one elderly resident living in one of the uh, old apartments and uh, yeah, I, I don't know what happened to her, but uh, well, she's gone. And um, you know what they did with this? They built a city park, which is a great idea because if you want to go to a city park, there aren't many in Seoul. But if you're here, you know, you don't want to have to walk another 50 meters to get to this city park. So, um, good choice. <laughs> so, the WOW apartments, uh, this was kind of when uh, this age of these kind of apartment buildings came to a close. Uh, built in probably, I haven't found that date, but I'm guessing the very beginning of 1970. Uh, it collapsed four months after completion, killing 33 uh, residents, uh, I believe. Maybe in the building, maybe some below. Uh, you can see these uh, buildings here. These would probably be, Waosan is the mountain behind Hongik University, so I think it was kind of towards Gwanghungchang Station. 
Um, and you can see here, there's just kind of nothing. This is where one of the buildings collapsed. Everybody thinks when, a, when an apartment collapses, it just kind of goes timber and falls down like that one in China. But uh, this one was uh, not built that way. It just disintegrated on the way down. Uh, so um, it led to uh, the, the follow-up from this led to the, uh, the mayor, uh, Kim Hyun-ho, uh, nicknamed the bulldozer, which might sound familiar, stepping down. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end of this style of, of apartments. Anyway, I want to uh, hurry along, so uh, maybe we'll skip some of these. Uh, I'll talk briefly about Yo-Yo and... No, actually, we'll talk about this quickly. Gangnam and why we have Kim Il-sung to thank for it. Uh, probably a, a few of you have seen the movie Shinomido, uh, which is based on the real events when uh, North Korean commandos infiltrated South Korea and got pretty close to uh, the president. So he uh, then they went on to, to found Unit 684, and which would inspire the movie. But also, um, Park Chung he decided to refocus urban development to the other side of the river uh, and look more at Gangnam and Yoido in order to, uh, to to build somewhere that was a little bit more, uh, let's say, strategically safe. This is a picture of Gangnam basically under construction. I don't know which uh, building this is, uh, but uh, it's the one right next to the uh, field being plowed by a farmer with oxes. So if you can find that today, I'm, I'm sure you couldn't. And Yoido and Bansom uh, is a very interesting story also. Uh, Yoido used to be long ago an animal pasture. The land really wasn't that stable and you couldn't build on it and uh, it was pretty awful. The name is supposed to mean you can have it, island or useless. Um, <laughs> great name. Uh, in uh, 1924, it was a home to Seoul's first airport. And uh, it was connected uh, by bridge to Seoul only uh, as late as 1970, uh, because this was an island. But the interesting, uh, the interesting thing about it, of course, being an airport, could you imagine anything easier to uh, build over? So it was uh, very easy to, to create an entirely new city area that to me really feels like a, almost a North American downtown core. So uh, the, the interesting thing about how they connected these two, of course, is uh, the other island here, Pamsam. Some of you might have uh, heard of this. Uh, you're not allowed to go there. It's only for animals. Um, in order to connect Yoido with the, uh, with the uh, mainland down here, they basically uh, dredged up dirt, well, uh, land from Bamsam and laid it down here. And Bamsam pretty well disappeared under the, uh, under the waves, not waves, I guess. Uh, but only uh, years after that, Bamsam resurfaced somehow. So, uh, yeah, and it's become a very interesting untouched part of the city. I'm not going to talk about the attractions of Yoido, but blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Uh, so let's get to uh, modern urban development, which is uh, much more my specialty right now. Uh, we're going to talk about apartment mega, mega complexes and how they're made. Moon apartments, which is kind of my name for like we have Dal Dongne, so why not Dal apartment, which are totally different. Remodeling, which we're not going to talk about much. New town projects. We already talked about vanity projects. So major redevelopment projects in Seoul. This is a big long list. I'm actually going to skip right now because all of these 34 projects were cancelled, as far as I can tell, as of, I guess, 2014. Um, but let's look at Sudowon. Uh, that's the Seoul capital area, which includes Seoul, Incheon, and Gyeonggi-do. Uh, the population of that is 25.6 million, making it the third largest area in the world. And uh, yeah, if you, if you drive around this area, you'll never really notice where you know city ends and another city begins. Uh, but the strategy for the last, uh, since 1988, has been to develop Seoul by building communities outside of the city. So that's why you have places like Gundang, Ilsan, Sandung, and so on. Uh, this is a list of all of the uh, first and second phase new cities. The first new, yeah, the first new cities are like Ilsan in, in kind of this gray color, and the second new cities are in uh, blue, like this. So there are a lot to go, um, and their populations are pretty large. But these are just like parts of existing cities already. They're just building density into existing cities. Like how Gundang is in Songnam, or Sanbon is in Gunpo, or whatever. Uh, so they're cramming people in any way they can, not only in the city. Oh, and uh, if you went on my Songdo uh, tour, then uh, here's your chance to make an appearance in an RES lecture. Um, 
they've been trying hard to decentralize Seoul's power by uh, creating things like Songdo IFES uh, to take on a lot of the economic uh, weight, which it hasn't picked up yet. And uh, as well, Sejong City, which is becoming the administrative capital and trying to decentralize the government that way. Uh, we'll see if it's working. Nobody seems to like uh, Sejong City so far, I'd have to say. Anyway, uh, how is the land cleared for most of these uh, construction projects? Uh, this is the picture I used to advertise the, uh, this talk today, actually, on, I think this one was on Facebook, or, or on my website, or on the ARES website. This is what it looks like today. Uh, this, uh, this was sometime late last year, this is sometime early this year. It was uh, very quick, I have to say. Um, I, was, I was quite sad to see it go. I used to, this is in uh, Shin Gumho. Shin Gumho Station is around here. I used to live in Gumho, kind of over here. And uh, I originally moved there because I loved the area and uh, the, the beautiful uh, kind of urban layout that it had, which is now mostly gone. Uh, I also used this picture to, to um, uh, advertise online. Uh, this is uh, Gumho 20 Guyak. I'm not going to use Ishik Guyak. Um, and this, uh, when I first moved to Gumho, I saw this area and I thought, well, this must be where the, where the really nice rich families live. I, I went out there and walked around and I was, I liked it because these were actually like often single occupancy houses. Like they're three stories tall, they're skinny. And they'd, they'd have a, a lifestyle like what you might expect in North America, except they're so crammed together with tiny, tiny yards. But it was, it was to me, very, very visually appealing. This is what it looks like today. Uh, I uh, was really sad to see that one go. Of course, there was already demolition in, happening in the lower left corner there. Uh, th that was all kind of smaller buildings, so. But seeing that also broke my heart. Um, this, this is a view into Kyonam, yeah, Kyonam Dong, that's Donimun Newtown, just, just over by Donimun, the, the gate. Uh, I refer to these uh, green striped blankets as the flag of Korean urban renewal. They'll wrap them up around uh, anything that you're not supposed to look at, and then most people won't look at them. Uh, I don't know how you can ignore that when it's, the blankets are so ugly. Uh, on the other side, you can see garbage piled up, and beyond that, you can just see ruins and very few homes left, and then more city in the distance because it's Korea. Uh, but it's uh, always something that uh, catches my eye that I, I have to go and look closer. Uh, let's talk about uh, urban renewal and some of the negative consequences. Of course, if you lived in this place, it's not good. But uh, if you didn't live here, then you might see the advantage of this part of the city upgrading so that maybe you'll have access to nicer places. But there are several problems with that that especially happen, happen during the process that are addressed in different amounts of levels by the government and the construction companies. I, uh, somehow I came up, I, I woke up the other day with the word moonscaping in my, in a piece of paper in my pocket, and uh, as far as I can remember when I thought of the word, it refers to uh, what happens in these places when they're just big empty dust bowls that are left uh, for the, the wind to kick up dust and uh, cause extra pollution. This can be a, a, a very unpleasant source of air pollution if you live nearby. Uh, as these areas go on, they try to cover them up with netting and everything. Uh, or in this case with this blue tarp. Um, so the idea is hopefully they keep the amount of dust down. But uh, it's not pleasant and it takes quite a long time. Um, yeah, so this is over in Hongundong. This is Gajeul New Town. It's over by uh, uh, Gajua area. Yeah, basically kind of by uh, Digital Media City. Uh, this is one of the largest new towns I've ever seen and if I had the ability to show panoramas on this, I would have, because, you know, it's, it's quite a large distance, you know, uh, like 180 degrees around me. Uh, so, an area like this used to be a regular neighborhood, just like the other ones I showed you. And now there's the same road cutting through, uh, but nobody can really see what's on the other sides here. That can be pretty terrifying, uh, and I'm going to show you a video of why, if I can. Some of you might have seen this not too long ago uh, uh, in Yongsan, so if you want to go on my tour you can see this. Uh, some people just made, had a, a very unpleasant surprise when they left the bus. Oh. Yeah, uh, that's fortunately, um, I'm, a, I'm a little happy that that uh, made the news because it means it doesn't happen that often. 
<laughs> so it's kind of always good if, if, if that's surprising to everybody. I've got to figure out how to get back on the track. Okay. Yeah, so um, fortunately there isn't a lot of foot traffic along here, but uh, it wouldn't be a very pleasant place to go because you don't know what's on the other side of that fence. Another very uh, common complaint that surrounding neighboring communities have is of noise of construction, of course. This construction might be going on for three or four or five years, depending on how big and how fraught with uh, you know, disasters a construction project is. Uh, so you see these banners a lot. Right behind me as I was taking this picture was a very lousy, uh, sorry, loud uh, development project going on. Another thing that I find really uh, sad, like, especially with Dong Dae Moon, was basically Dong Dae Moon was incomplete from 2008 to 2014. So there was just this metal fence, and they were slowly clearing out stadiums and putting in the Dong Dae Moon design plaza. But the, the actual Dong Dae Moon that we knew before was half gone, and uh, so we just didn't have access to it for a long time. Uh, it's, it's really got to be tough financially for everybody to agree to set aside that amount of time. Of course, with Dome Inman, they intended to have it built by 2010, not 14. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's what can happen. You can uh, lose part of, a large part of a neighborhood. Uh, in other cases, more residential cases, they'll actually not partition off the land like that. They'll just leave the roads open so you can wander through. Uh, I've, I've been to one abandoned neighborhood somewhere up uh, north, I think in Noongu where a couple kids actually went out climbing in one of these areas and died. Uh, fortunately, that doesn't happen so often, but it does happen, and uh, these areas are generally left open to the public to wander through as they see fit, as you can see this uh, woman and her two probably grandchildren doing. Uh, this uh, picture, uh, looking at it now, it didn't bother me at the time, but it terrifies me now because um, there's a school up here, and there's a neighborhood, and there's a fence, and a big plunge, where there used to be a neighborhood. Uh, this actually made the news right after the Sewon Ho last year. Uh, on the other side of the hill is another urban renewal area, and uh, people were remarking on how they were digging out so clear the school that people were worried about a collapse. Uh, that is probably a concern people should have. Uh, I don't think I would want to live up here, I'll be honest. I, I'm sure that there are scientists looking out over it, but uh, I don't know if I want to trust my life to them. So uh, I wanted to talk briefly about traditional Korean architecture, a very popular thing among RES people, uh, but it's not quite my specialty. I have seen a lot of Hanok villages uh, destroyed, and I've, I live in a Hanok village that's being preserved through uh, some very ineffective legislation. Uh, one thing uh, I was able to find online is a list of the Hanok population of the city in 2006 and 2014. So this is all in Korean, but by different gu. So in Jongno gu, where we are now, there were 6,336 Hanoks in 2006, 4,143 in 2014. Uh, that's a decrease of 35%. If you look at some of the worst places, like, uh, well, yeah, Songdonggu is a bad one. Uh, they went from 943 to 187. Uh, so these places are really getting rid of Hanoks as fast as possible. Oh, yeah, Mapogu is a pretty bad one, too. But uh, so the, yeah, this is a relevant number here, but it's not weighted for the size overall. Uh, but it's, it's uh, shocking to see how many they can go through. All of these are now demolished, of course. Uh, this is uh, in Bukchon Hanok village. I literally took it out my bedroom window. This is a Hanok that I'm going to show you how it was preserved. Uh, step one, well this is what it looked like before. Step one is demolition. And uh, clear out the rest of it. Make sure nothing's left. Uh, put in some concrete. Step two, build an entirely new Hanok. And uh, you might even notice that the uh, the way that it is uh, you know, laid out is completely different. It has no relationship to the new one. That's the last picture of that. Uh, I refer to these now as pod people Hanoks, because it's like, there's a Hanok over there, but it doesn't look like the one that I remember from a short while ago. Uh, there's just something unsettling about it. But that is a very common thing that's happening in Bukchon. Uh, that basically means the neighborhood might retain a lot of its uh, characteristics, 
Um, but it'll slowly over time phase out the, the individual buildings that it has. Uh, this is actually completed on a much larger process uh, in a, called apartment remodeling. Sometimes it's just a heavy renovation. Sometimes, as in the case of these buildings, Dogok uh, Hyundai apartments in um, uh, somewhere near, uh, well, Dogok, but closer to Yangjie Station, they uh, put up fences over these, tore them down, built new ones in their place. And that's remodeling. <laughs> so uh, how do you demolish a building like this? Uh, most of us think of demolition as dynamite or TNT. You make the plunger go down and the building falls. But we don't do that here. Uh, this, actually, this picture was taken from the roof of this building. Uh, this is the old uh, Korea Herald building. Or no, this one is. Um, so they park an excavator on top and it chews its way down, floor by floor. I've got a few other examples of that. This is Sogyo Hotel in, uh, next to Hongdae Station. Uh, that one didn't get a lot of attention when they removed it. They just uh, put out that uh, fence, put an excavator on top and chewed down. Uh, this one I just noticed last week. Uh, this was a, an old tax building kind of near the uh, British Embassy. Um, and then this is Duxergum here. They were actively demolishing it, and down here was a very large Christian protest of the Gay Pride Parade, who probably didn't know what was happening on the other side of that wall once again. Uh, and that is very concerning to me because uh, this can happen. Oops. Yeah, uh, this is Nasan Home Place, or Nasan Dekwajan, uh, a department store that was located in uh, uh, Gangnam Gu, kind of near Gangnam Gu Chung Station. And I think it was 2008, uh, during demolition, the excavator was chewing its way down and the whole thing just collapsed and two workers ended up dying. Um, it did not make the news the same way as other uh, you know, department store collapses did. Thankfully, as I said, only two people died, but this happened during demolition. And this is not what demolition is supposed to look like. So yeah, pretty shocking. Uh, the thing that could happen in a lot of these places when they clear out, especially the larger neighborhoods, they need to dig out the land itself, like you saw it in that one picture earlier. This is a picture of uh, a hill where all the buildings have dem been demolished. This was actually a, apparently a, a Catholic holy site located just uh, southwest of Sangati Station. Uh, there was a hill there, maybe about 100 meters tall, with a, an old Catholic site on top and a church and everything. Uh, they knocked down all the buildings and they dug out the ground and removed the hill itself and put apartments there. So um, there's just something strange to me about that where you know you can remove not only the buildings but the land from underneath them. It just shows that uh, so many of these projects don't, uh, aren't aware of any kind of link with uh, anything that came before them. I guess it might have been nice to have apartments on a hilltop there. I don't know, maybe it wasn't stable or something. Uh, so how this happens is um, one, of the, one of the most important aspects of uh, how you get people to clear out. A lot of people will leave, they'll take the resettlement package and go. But a lot of others have to be uh, coerced out by hired goons, which uh, one of the names for them is Chagra Yongyok. And uh, basically they're unskilled muscle that's contracted by corporations. They'll probably work for a, a company with a, a, you know, one name and they'll be contracted to uh, construction corporations or small governments, like these are the same people who evicted pe the uh, marketeers from in Sedong and more recently in Gangnam. Uh, they don't require much training, uh, they just need a jacket and then they can go and do their thing. Uh, common tactics are dumping trash, terrifying residents, disrupting businesses, vandalism and graffiti. Um, these uh, pictures are from uh, Yongsan District 4. Uh, which we'll be talking about in, in a bit. You can see this area in particular, the, the imagery is especially violent. We have a guy being hung over, hanged over there. What looks like somebody who's been castrated and beheaded. Maybe that's his head there. And a flaming skull, so some pretty disturbing stuff. Um, this is over in uh, Wangshimi Newtown, which went down the year after, maybe 2010. I noticed uh, that uh, there were two competing people writing here. The first person wrote, Oma, Musowa, uh, Isakayo, Apa, and he spell, they spell Apa wrong, of course. Apa, and I can't read the rest, but something, let's leave, I think. Um, and then somebody else came over top and wrote, Kanpe, which is kind of a, a, a pejorative meaning like gangster. Uh, it's a pejorative used to describe these people, but it also gives the impression that they're organized crime. They're really just organized laborers whose 
paid job is to hurt people, and they can do that under the watchful protection of the police if necessary. Uh, one of the bizarre things I've noticed going to uh, abandoned places, uh, the wording here is very specific. Uh, I, I don't have a blow up, but the same thing was written down here. I can read it, but you can't. Basically, ama, apa, muso oyo, isaka go shibayo, or whatever. Uh, so I suspect that must have been the same person. I don't think they're trading notes about like, hey, what do you draw on buildings? Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's trade notes here. I, I draw flaming skulls. You do that, oh cool. So I, I, I would like to study this more and find like signature artists. You know, maybe they deserve to be in an art gallery somewhere. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Uh, so of course, uh, th those hired goons exist because of evicting protest movements. Uh, this guy, I photographed him uh, on my way to an RES lecture last year. Uh, you, it's, it's hard to read the sign, but uh, you can find it later. Basically, um, I saw his sign and I discovered at the bottom he wrote, Gumho Ishibuya, and I thought, oh, I know that place. So I went there and sure enough, the buildings were being cleared out. Um, generally, these, these people are asking for resettlement money. They don't really care too much for preservation of their neighborhoods. Uh, they just want a better standard of living. And you really can't blame them, I think. Uh, the, the people who stand up and are protesting generally are the ones who are getting the worst deals. Uh, a lot of people do get good deals, of course. Uh, the people who uh, participate in these, in these movements are generally not seen very favorably by mainstream culture. Uh, they're, they're seen as holding that progress or asking for too much money uh, out of those poor construction companies. Um, so yeah, this, here's another example. This is in Guangyang where uh, you can see, you know, the residents are exactly who you think. Elderly people with not many other places to go. Younger people can just move out and find another place. But this is, uh, especially with the population curve right now, uh, this, the housing situation for elderly people is going to be one of the big uh, human rights problems of this country in the next five or ten years. Uh, this is uh, an evicti uh, protest uh, will sales stand in front of Dongdae Moon Stadium. These are the same people who were kicked out uh, in order to build Dongdaemun Design Plaza. In 2009, they liked to have this little decal everywhere that says, World Design Capital, Seoul 2010. That would sometimes find its way to very ironic places. This guy was, uh, he, he ran a store uh, kind of uh, west of Guanghamun. Uh, well, west of, I don't know what to call it, west of the Isun Shin statue. They knocked down uh, kind of a, a commercial area there. And uh, I walked by. He's posing very proudly in front of a picture of himself being hauled away by the police. So, uh, <laughs> um, another way that these uh, uh, movements can uh, manifest themselves is in uh, something that uh, is known in China as nail houses. If anybody can read Chinese, uh, simplified Chinese, I think it's Ding Tihu, but I, I don't speak Chinese. Uh, it basically refers to a nail that can't be hammered down, unlike all the others. So you've, you've probably seen some of the famous pictures where there's just a cleared lot and then in the middle a column of dirt with a house on top where the people don't want to come out. That happens in Korea too and it doesn't get as much attention. Over by, I think, Aoge Station, uh, this area, actually yeah, this is, this is the same as before, the area where you know, they carved up downhill. Uh, there was a church here and a couple homes probably belonging to people from the church. And uh, so obviously these people had a, a legal uh, thing tying them up in court so that they could stay here longer as everything else is removed from around them. And they're left literally on this like peak coming out of the middle of a construction site with uh, nothing on either side. It's uh, quite shocking to see places like this always. Uh, of course, um, if uh, these people are not handled properly, it can lead to some really awful things happening. Uh, in uh, February 2008, uh, we lost uh, Sungne Moon, one of the uh, gates of, uh, of Central Seoul. Uh, this uh, fire was created by uh, an elderly guy who was being evicted, and it doesn't sound like he, uh, he had everything working right in his head. So he decided, you, t you destroyed my house, I'm going to destroy this. And that's what happened, and it was, uh, it was an awful thing. Uh, fortunately, it's been rebuilt now, although maybe not as, not as nicely. Um, one of, the, one of the good things to come out of a lot of these uh, movements, though, they're not all, you know, fighting tooth and nail against hired goons and the police. Some places uh, find creative reuses, uh, like they might become temporary spaces for artists. This is a place called Space Theme in uh, Incheon, near Bedari, an area that's going through some 
probable uh, changes in the near future. Uh, this place actually receives funding from the Incheon city government. So um, it's, uh, this building in particular is a, an old Mockley factory, now an art venue. So very cool. This is an old military installation in Kumcheonggu. I took this picture literally standing on Kumcheonggu office. Um, this, uh, I was told, was called, the, the base was nicknamed Doha, which is supposed to mean cross, crossing the river. And it was where they would build temporary bridges and bring them to the uh, Han if the Korean War repeated itself and all of us up here needed to be evacuated to the southern side. The bridge that would save us would come out of here. It's no longer active. Um, this little building in the uh, lower right corner was turned into an art camp, Gyeongchon Art Camp. And a lot of artists took up residence there and had use of this space for at least a year. Uh, this is a picture uh, taken inside Duriban. Uh, it was uh, a little noodle house building, three stories tall, right next to Hongik University Station, where they actually managed to um, find a way to communicate with the local artist community. They invited writers in, they invited artists, they invited musicians, and if anybody is too familiar, uh, this is the lead singer of Bamsam Pirates. Uh, and so they had such a flow of young people coming there, they were actually able to get a, a fair resettlement package and reopen somewhere else. Uh, before that happened, they, uh, this is a, an overview of the area. You can see this is Duriban here. This is an old Hanuk that was a restaurant. This is a police station that still is there today. Uh, and this is construction of the Gyeonggi line, uh, that, uh, the Gyeonggi station, part of Hongik University Station. Uh, in uh, 2010, May 1st, for May Day, they had uh, 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 a concert they called uh, Party 51. And this was actually made into a movie very recently that came out in January uh, by a filmmaker who followed them around for the entire time. They had a 525-day protest against the, uh, against the redevelopment that they won, and it's all in film anyway. It's a very interesting place. Where do most evictees go? Well, not most evictees. I should say most evictees safely move away. Where do the worst off evictees go? Um, depends on the compensation. This is an area I... This is... Uh, what's it called? Down in uh, Hoidong? Uh, kind of near Guryong, Guryong village, that's right, uh, that's in the news a lot because it was just declared that this will be uh, shut down and demolished and they're hopefully going to build housing for the current residents in the, in the new development, hopefully. But I actually, it seems to be commonly believed online that this community started when they were evicted in order to build um, the Olympic Stadium. It's possible they didn't live on the spot of the stadium, but there were a lot of beautification projects carried out uh, to, to clear out a lot of um, shanty towns outside of city limits. This is just on the edge of city limits. So uh, that could be why they moved there. This one is over just on the edge, uh, kind of north of, um, what's it called, World Cup Stadium. So this one is actually gone now already. It was much smaller and didn't get as much attention. Um, and Yongsan, let's talk about that because I'm leading that tour there. How much time do I have? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yongsan is an area where a lot of really bad things happen. Some of them because of incompetence. Some of them because of just too many eggs in one basket. Some of them just because of bad luck. And others just, yeah. So uh, this is Yongsan Station here. And over here is Yongsan Rail Yard, which is now just an empty lot. Most of these buildings have been cleared up, but not all. And there is an extreme a large amount of toxic materials still contained in the earth here. And um, I'll get to what happened with that later. Uh, over here is Yongsan District 4, uh, which is now also totally cleared out. Over here is the former red light district. They're now building a, uh, like a couple one-room tell kind of buildings here uh, on, on either side. And they've also got uh, kind of a tent village uh, which has some very cheap, affordable food. It's a, a fun night of drinking if you go out there. As well, they uh, recently, uh, if you cross over the overpass and go to the electronics market, the first building there, the terminal electronics market, they've removed that and they're now building a luxury, you know, a tourist hotel there. Why anybody would want to stay in a hotel overlooking an empty rail yard, I don't know. Um, and there's also Sobu Ichandong, which was supposed to be demolished uh, along with this in order to make the giant uh, IBD, what's that again? The, uh, yeah. Nicola, you want to help me? What's that called? <laughs> the Yongsan project. Yeah, 
I mean, that was right, yeah. Um, so over here was going to be Yongsan Link. I believe they were going to build an underground mall. This is going to be a giant uh, complex. Oh, yeah, I should. Oh, Dream Hub, that's it, yeah. It's an IBD. Um, yeah. And they had uh, all sorts of plans for it where it looks beautiful and golden and everything. It was going to cost 30 trillion uh, Korean won, and the land was going to be on uh, an area roughly equivalent to 33 soccer fields. Uh, here's another design that they came up with that was not popular because a uh, little Americans felt a bit sensitive about that, and I think you can see why. That was going to be at Yongsan, and it fell through, thankfully. <laughs> Uh, although maybe it would have been better to have this than uh, what actually is there. But uh, over on the other side at uh, Yongsan District, District 4 is where the Yongsan disaster happened. It was called Yongsan Chansa. I'm really going to have to get go a bit faster. But on January 20, 2009, basically uh, this happened. Uh, it looks like it was a big fire that uh, uh, occurred on top of this building. And up here was uh, an evicti kind of uh, hideout where they, they had a kind of fortress set up to protect themselves. And the police uh, moved in, set up a crane, um, took a cargo con container, filled it with anti-terrorist uh, anti riot police, and had them lift it up and drop down on the building. Because the, the basically, to, to try to end a standoff really quickly, they couldn't go in from uh, below, because the evictees had been pouring all sorts of accelerants on the stairs, saying, like, if you come in here, you'll spark a fire, you'll kill us all. You wouldn't do that, right? So they decided to try to get around it like this, and it didn't work. Uh, one police officer and five protesters died. Uh, and that is when urban renewal became a very public issue in Korea. I wish that they had picked up on it earlier, because the story for these people had started oh, at least a year in advance. They were already being harassed by the hired goons. The pictures earlier of that uh, very violent graffiti was taken just about down here. Uh, so those people were camped out on this roof because they had to hide and protect each other from the hired goons. Um, and uh, there were reports that they were throwing things, including Molotov cocktails, from the roof. Uh, some reports say they were throwing this randomly, wildly at any citizens. Other reports say they were throwing them to ward off the hired goons. Uh, who knows, probably when you're throwing things from a roof, both could be true, I'll be honest. Um, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I'll just plug the RES visit to Yongsan. We can actually go to the site where this was. The buildings are all gone. Uh, what's in their place is a parking lot. Uh, this is the, build the picture I used at the start because I wanted to uh, uh, show that they decided to have this World Design Capital, Seoul 2010, Design for All banner right in front of the building where the fire took place. <laughs> so uh, probably one of the most tasteless pictures I've ever taken. Not. Not, that's not on me, though, of course. But uh, this was taken maybe uh, a month after after that, and uh, yeah, it was pretty shocking. I'll see what else is. Yeah, Yongsan today, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's a big, empty area with a big crater-looking thing in the middle. Uh, I think it was uh, Robert Kohler on his blog uh, said, I sometimes think the Seoul Metropolitan Government should leave the big empty hole in Yongsan, as it is a memorial to bad city planning. I kind of agree. Uh, over at Yongsan District 4, uh, you can see it's, it's pretty well nothing. Uh, the whole lot is overgr overgrown with reeds and weeds and everything. Uh, a quote I got from the media from the, the widow of one of the, uh, the protesters who died. She said, I'd feel less wrong if a new building was standing. So that really makes us think, like, if you're going to go to the trouble to evict people, at least go to the trouble of following through and building something in its place. I think, I think that's a lesson that we have to learn from Yongsan. Um, of course, we have to remember that apartments are much nicer. I'm sure many of you live in nice, modern apartments here. I lived in one for a while. Uh, they have a higher quality of life. They're clean, spacious. Uh, you have hot water all the time, better, better water quality. You could probably drink out of the tap now. Uh, most of us would really want to live in one of these. Uh, they are exclusive and not available for everyone. Uh, probably even if there was poor housing made, uh, the same thing would happen that happened in the 60s probably all students would move into it, rather than elderly poor people. Uh, so something needs to be done. Uh, I have problems with them, of course. They discourage through traffic, uh, which I think is going to duplicate the negative effects we've seen of cul-de-sacs in North America, where it creates communities that are uh, car-based. And it also decreases safety, because it's harder for ambulances to get in. It's, uh, you know, there's less foot traffic, so you know, if something bad happens, it's less likely to be witnesses whether that means an accident or a crime. 
I could have them. They're ugly as hell, aren't they? I mean, you look around the city and you just see non-stop high-rises. They're, they're, not, they're not nice on the eyes, but that's, that's an aesthetic matter that I think could be easily addressed and is improving. Uh, and also, probably, they're not going to last forever also. They'll probably be gone in 30 or 40 years, or at least uh, renovated. Uh, what's lost? We lose economic, economic diversity and mixed income housing, where you have, uh, let's say, working class people living with middle class people living with uh, you know, rich people, which, I'll be honest, sounds like my ideal way of living. We lose mixed use residential commercial zoning, where you, know, you can just go outside and there's stores right there. Uh, we miss organic developed communities with their own architectural and geographic histories, and we lose walkable neighborhoods. So all of these are things that I do uh, regret. And I think we're at the end. Yeah, we can skip all of that. Uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about that right now. So let's call it the end. Okay. Thank you. Two questions. Uh, I'll make it. You report, you, report, you have to report uh, the reality of building. Uh, I think maybe you should use the microphone. Building, building construction activity in Seoul. Oh, the, you, that I've visited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, I don't know if I can go to the beginning. Yes. But uh, what should be the ideal type of uh, residence? Uh, what should be the ideal type of residence? Feature, yeah, 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 feature. Personally, I think that maybe everybody has their own answer to this. I, I think I hinted at it in that last slide, where I think it's good to have mixed, uh, mixed income uh, housing, so that you have people of different economic backgrounds living together as well as uh, commercial residential mixed in um, in a much more updated version of what is in the old building so I think uh, obviously progress has to go through don't you think so uh, as far as communities that I think are doing better and there are problems with them I'm more impressed these days with uh, it's called Yonhi Dong if you know that one where they're renovating building building by building but not destroying that much heritage and making an interesting uh, uh, kind of residential commercial community that feels modern. So that would be my preference. Is, is, does that answer? Yes, please. Okay, this is not a question, but better uh, for similar language. Uh, in our language, the area, vicinity or surrounding the Great Tour, uh -huh. we call it Sokhan. Sudokan, yeah. Sudokan. But you translate it into Korean to Tokhan. Oh, did I? Whoops! <laughs> so you must correct for your next test. Thank you, yes. Okay, I, I like getting uh, corrected on my uh, spelling. <laughs> Anybody else have any other corrections? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah? Regarding, uh, you may not be able to answer this, and so I'll just don't bother, but regarding um, architectural heritage, um, you know, I'm sure you're aware it's a massive. Yeah. Bomb crater behind the uh, Samsung Securities building in Chongno. I looked there a few weeks ago. There were a lot of foundations from what looked to me like very old buildings. Like so mean, they're from the 1850s or the, the 1950s or the, the 1450s. But you mean um, like that? it looked a bit, a little bit like that. But I think it's a slightly larger lot. Okay. And uh, I have to look in the other day. They covered it all up, and now it's just literally a hole. Chongo Tower, right? Behind the Chongo Tower. Yes, yeah. yeah. So what is the, are there national or city regulations which protect these areas before the construction goes ahead? I, I can't speak to that. I actually wish uh, that uh, uh, our friend Jo Eun Suk was here because she would definitely know the answer. Uh, but as far as I can tell, all they have to do is do the survey, see what there is, and then maybe take some items away, and then just get rid of the rest. I mean, when, it, when you get down to it, it's interesting that these walls are here, but what value can they really make of it? I mean, other than making yet another one of these. So uh, I, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know the letter of the law itself, uh, you know, so uh, that's something I want to look into because I think it's becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Uh, like that, that area that you're talking about, that's the one that went viral when somebody posted a, a picture on some architecture website. And uh, did you see that? Yeah, it, was, it was like right when they had everything excavated. And then immediately after that, they just started wiping it out. Yeah, that's what it is now. Just yeah. Here is also Charles. The situation with the what was to be the new U.S. Embassy building, and then 
Yeah, pretty much behind the US ambassador photons, which is just nothing's happened there for about 10, 10 years. Oh, in the Dutch region? No, no, yeah. well, literally right next to the US ambassador. Yeah, Trump. Yeah, Trump. yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, not in the duct I, I remember the name of the place, it's kind of complicated. Yeah. Uh, let's maybe, we can talk about it after. I, I've got a lot more information about that place. Uh, yes, Rim. Hi, John. You uh, told me uh, on a walk up, you once said that, uh, and I was rather surprised that you said it was an American who actually got the historic uh, preservation going in that the cultural district uh, down here. And uh, I'm wondering if, 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 if it's a uh, uh, but now it seems like it's a very, very vibrant uh, uh, tourist area. Bukchon, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm, is, is, uh, is the sort of preservation becoming more of a, uh, of a you know, uh, kind of like homegrown, home, home driven interest, or is it, is it taking that, is it taking that foreigner to this sort of Well, that, that area is extremely popular with Korean tourists as well as all sorts of other areas. Okay, I'll use the mic then. Uh, basically, the area is, is popular with all sorts of people. Like living there, I see Korean tourists more than I see Chinese tourists, more than I see Japanese tourists, more than everybody else. Uh, it's, it's a strange area. As I said, um, like they're, they're replacing it building by building at a time so that maybe in 10 years we'll look around and say, oh, look at the heritage. And not a single building will be you know, more than 10 years old. Uh, it's, it's preferable to some of the other things that they do. Uh, as far as preservation, it's unusual because residents are moving out and a lot of the places are becoming businesses. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm, uh, I'm reserving my judgment on that one. Sokchon. Sokchon and Sangchon. Oh yeah, uh, so, I, we're, we're talking about Bukchon and yeah, Sangchon. Sangchon. It's, it's very unarchic. Yeah, yeah. I, I have much less to say about Sangchon. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wish that um, you could probably use a little bit more balanced um, perspective towards your presentation. There, do you want a uh, microphone? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not saying necessarily everything new is better, no. but at the, at the same time, I, I don't agree that everything old should be preserved just because they're old. Yeah, I have to agree. Yeah. So, um, I was hoping, you because you spent a lot of time discussing the negative consequences of renewal project, mm -hmm. but there should be also like some, hope, some positive consequences, I'm sure there yeah. So, maybe you can probably also cover that the future. And I have three points to make. Mm -hmm. First one is um, about the toxic um, things in the Dongsan development area. Because they were done by U.S. Uh, not in that one, as far as I know. That was originally, uh, the, the toxins would have got there because of core rail's um, uh, rail yard. If the U.S. military had any access there, uh, somebody might have to tell me about that. Yes, uh, but in larger context, like you also also part of the plan. Oh yeah. So, yeah. So that one. Another one is I think um, regarding the Nonsense disaster. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody who was protest for protesting. No, the absolutely not. Mm -hmm. and, um, so that was pretty bad. And the government had a reason to step in. Yeah. Would it have been nice if they were not there? Yes. Yeah. And another one is the Nonsense development. Um, project. It was because of the poor planning, but at the same time, the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, the, the project didn't collapse until 2002. Yeah, sure. But I really enjoyed your presentation. It was really good. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I, I have to address some of those. First of all, I, I have to admit that I can only show you so much in an hour. One of the other slides is a bit more about how Yongsan will change. Um, personally, uh, the people that I know who were involved in the uh, Yongsan protest, and uh, even a few of them actually appeared at uh, Judiban later, uh, are uh, many of them are quite radicalized, and these movements do attract radical elements. So uh, for that reason, it's it's good for people to not try to help too closely with uh, with evicted movements because you never know if if it's a person who's actually up for money, or if they're just out to to make the government look bad. In the case of the Yongsan disaster, one of the biggest problems with that though was that. Um, it was in such a visible area. Um, 
the, the police uh, moved in much earlier than they normally would have. Normally those protests can go on with like a little rooftop house for, uh, for months, maybe even a year or two. Uh, but in this case, uh, the first day that the police took charge of it, they, uh, they loaded up and uh, went in. So uh, it was, maybe it would have happened the same if they waited a month, I don't know. But uh, it, was, it was definitely mishandled. Um, I, if you've seen the movie Two Doors or Two Changi Moon, it, it goes into a lot of detail about that. Did I say that right? Two Gay Moon? I forget. Because I passed that area, but that thing happened. So yeah. I remember it was very scary to me that there were jumping Yeah. Well, the scary image for me was coming there uh, shortly after and seeing the remaining evictees having a memorial there. There were maybe about six of them. And then on both sides of the streets were riot police buses as far as the eye could see. That to me was the scary part. But, yeah. Uh, I, I just flew out from, uh, from San Francisco where, it, where it, um, you know, gentrification in the Mission District in Silicon Valley is a, is a very hot topic as well. And we know that with large development projects, uh, the people who move out don't always move back in. And, you know, it's, so I, I wonder, and it may, it may not be a fair question to you because you're looking more at architecture and, and the use of the space, but do we have any knowledge about the uh, redistribution of Seoul's population by, by income or by age over the last 10, 15, 20 years? I don't have hard data. Uh, I've been, you know, kind of using uh, my own observations, which are faulty, of course. Um, but generally, the, uh, the new apartment buildings that come up are uh, intended for kind of yuppie families that are going to, you know, move in after getting married and raise a family. Uh, there really is no room in any of those high-rises that you see for uh, smaller families, poorer people, and things like that. Uh, generally, I mean, when, when that kind of uh, neighborhood goes down, uh, some people, uh, some of the, the owners actually have the, the opportunity to buy in so that they, if they keep their money invested in their old place as it's demolished, they can get uh, a lot in the new place. Um, but it's, it, it's surprisingly tricky to do that. Uh, and I, I uh, know somebody who went through that and hung on by a thread, but everybody else dropped out. So it's, it's a tricky thing. Um, the, the, the big issue right now uh, is just the, uh, the elderly poor who uh, have no place to go. So everybody else, like the, the younger student type people, they'll find somewhere else. Um, and they can, there's always places in Seoul. Sorry, Jen, I don't think we have time for more comments. I want to address that, because I do know something about that. Oh. Um, actually, the biggest housing um, gap area that they need to fill, but they're not, is for young families. Young so families? It's for small households of two people who are getting married, maybe have small children, who mm -hmm. cannot afford to buy into the apartments in the first place. Oh, yes, okay. Old people get displaced. Young people can't get in at all. Okay. Young poor families, you could young, have a point. Not, not even poor, middle class. Young middle class poor, yeah. Young, <laughs> right up to sort of the middle middle class. It's yes, yes. That's a very, very good point. Uh, those people can move into the older neighborhoods that might get evicted soon, uh, but it's not a place to evict, to, to start a family and to, uh, yeah, um, invest, really. The so, the housing that's being created is created for uh, too high in the market for the people actually need housing. Absolutely, but, yeah, that's a big problem. But the people who are occupying those, because there's a constant destruction of the property at the lower end, Mm -hmm. and it's being replaced with upper end housing, it's created a very big gap between who has housing and who needs housing. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you.